I'm Tom Huntley. I'm uh, Vice President of Government Relations and General Manager of Region Defense. I'm Adam Triello, VP Commercial to Business Development, uh, Sales, uh, Data, and Ecosystems at Region. Yeah. Uh, I was going to say Region is a, a dual-use company. Uh, we manufacture sea gliders. Uh, sea gliders are uh, flying vessels. They operate in three modes, float just like a boat, come up on hydrofoils, uh, once they're clear of the harbor, and then uh, once they're in, in open water, uh, fly low over the water in an aerodynamically uh, efficient zone called ground effect. And Tom, could you introduce Region Defense? There's a big announcement today. Could you tell us about kind of that new unit? Yeah, absolutely. Um, really since our inception, we have had a, uh, a, a vibrant and growing relationship with our defense partners. Um, today we announced Region Defense as a separate business unit because of this validation on our defense market. Uh, we just extended our Marine Corps Warfighting Lab contract for another $10 million and have its significant traction with uh, both our U.S. Defense Department uh, partners as well as our international allies and partners, including the Japanese Ministry of Defense, the U.K. Royal Navy, and, and others. And so today was a great moment to, to really announce what we've been doing since our inception, which is uh, building this dual-use technology for both commercial and defense purposes. And there's been a lot of traction on the commercial side as well. Could you talk about that and kind of what cities are you looking at to build out that network? Yeah, so um, as a reminder, we're manufacturing sea gliders, just like a Boeing or an Airbus. Uh, our operators uh, will actually take these uh, vessels out and provide commercial service. So end of day, our operators decide where they want to position these sea gliders. We support them in that effort. Um, as it relates to our operators, they have said that they love uh, a couple of major cities around the world. So it looks like they're probably going to start in places like Hawaii, Miami, uh, New York, uh, you know, Tokyo, um, other places in the Middle East uh, like uh, Dubai, for instance. Um, so these are all um, uh, locales that uh, our customers have said would uh, be perfect for sea glider operations. Uh, we're positioning ourselves to support them as they uh, take delivery of their vessels, uh, receive regulatory approvals to provide commercial service, and then begin to uh, start up their own individual operations. So uh, the, the commercial business development effort's been going for uh, just over four years. Uh, we've done just over 600 sea glider uh, orders, uh, roughly $10.5 billion worth of backlog, uh, and those vessels are going all over the world. Going back into history, we saw sea gliders with the Russians, right? And then we saw Boeing tried some things as well in the U.S. in the American market on the defense side. But could you talk about why is it the right time to enter the market on both the commercial and the defense side for, you know, the future of sea gliders and ground effect vehicles? On the commercial side, uh, there's been some key technological unlocks that have been provided by sea gliders, right? So if you look back to the Akronoplons uh, back in the 1960s, they were these massive 300-ton weapons of war. Uh, they had to have these uh, large jet engines positioned on a canard in the front to sort of drag them through the heavy surf. Um, they would get going as fast as they could to break the suction of the water beneath the wing surface and become airborne. All along the way, they had to be piloted by traditional pilots in that heavy workload space where they were maintaining a uh, ground effect uh, by controlling the pitch. Sea gliders are completely different, right? We leverage wing and ground effect uh, aerodynamic principles, right? We, we, we achieve that same aerodynamic efficiency, but we use the fly-by-wire flight control system. We use the uh, unique capabilities of the hydrofoil coupled with the blown wing. All of that technology combined allows us to get airborne at much lower speeds. Uh, it allows us uh, to control the vessel in the left-right, fast-slow, uh, two-dimensional control regime. Um, and it allows us to provide unparalleled levels of comfort uh, to the passengers in the back. So that enhanced wave tolerance is one of the, the key unlocks uh, associated with this. And then that all translates directly to the defense market. Um, very similarly, if you can move passengers and cargo safely, effectively, and inexpensively in the commercial market, you can move troops and gear and ammo in a contested environment in the littorals uh, throughout Indo-PACOM. And so, so these same technology unlocks uh, provide a, a unique mix of capability at an incredibly low uh, both acquisition and uh, operating costs for the warfighter. And on the defense side, could you talk about more of those end uses from medical evacuation to logistics to mm -hmm. supplying troops to even 
reconnaissance. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, I mean, the, the, the fundamental value proposition of the Sea Glider is, is it's high speed, long range, and low signature. And, and that means that it's, it's survivable uh, throughout a number of mission areas. Uh, what we're seeing is essentially four buckets of missions. Uh, contested logistics, moving people and, and parts throughout, uh, throughout a contested area, um, setting up basing, supporting uh, forward operating bases. Next, medevac and casualty evacuation, being able to rescue uh, down pilots, down crew in the maritime environment. Um, three is that uh, intelligence, uh, surveillance and reconnaissance, creating maritime uh, domain awareness throughout uh, the area. And then finally, launched effects, being able to be the platform that that launches either kinetics or uh, sono buoys or small uh, small UAS or USVs or UUVs, um, and really being the mothership for those platforms. And so, the the multi mission capability of the Sea Glider is really what brings uh, that high speed, long range, uh, low signature, and and fully survivable in into the defense market. And on the commercial side, you know, we've seen a lot of changes in mobility recently. You know, with EVs, with even Uber and Lyft, and now we're seeing Evitals enter the market. You know, how will Sea Glider shift uh, transportation for just the consumer? Yeah, I mean, I think end of day, uh, to, to Tom's earlier point, we have this huge advantage in terms of range, in terms of payload, and in terms of operating cost. So when you look at the advanced air mobility landscape, uh, we're talking about a lot of electric vertical takeoff and landing platforms. They serve a critical mission in that they can carry people from the coastlines into those busy uh, uh, city centers, uh, where they're more challenged is primarily in the space of, of range and cost of operations. So the EV tolls uh, can go uh, about 25 miles with one pilot and four passengers. That ticket price is going to run about $350 to $400. Sea gliders are different. Sea gliders can go uh, almost 200 miles. They can carry one captain and 12 passengers. And the average ticket price on a 100-mile leg is going to be closer to $50. Um, so what Sea gliders mean for regular people is access to high paying jobs, access to affordable housing, uh, greater access to medical care, uh, uh, easier commutes, less traffic, low cost uh, uh, transit, and so on. So, uh, sea gliders really are a game changer in terms of the ways we leverage existing dock infrastructure to move people in new ways. And we've seen a lot of technologies in Silicon Valley start off in defense and then go into the consumer market and vice versa. Could you talk about the importance of kind of being a dual use company and how it benefits working with people on both sides of the aisle? As it relates to being a dual use, right, we've been a dual use company from the very, very beginning. Um, you know, what we've found is that, uh, you know, uh, defense and commercial have highly symbiotic relationships, right? So the, the customer set and the mission set served by uh, the, the commercial client is also well served by the defense side. So for instance, when you think about all the technicians that will be trained up to service these sea gliders, all of the parts distribution nodes that will be created around the world to make sure that they're maintained. Um, uh, uh, all of the, the, the proficiency uh, and regulatory interface that will come from the various governments that will certify and, and uh, uh, unlock operations. All of these spaces have dual use potential and we're leveraging uh, all of those synergies to, to delight our customers, both military and commercial. And then I'd say the, the commercial market really buoys the, the defense uh, customer. Um, you know, this, this massive backlog on, on commercial that will, uh, in the very near future, be sea gliders operating around the world, that creates downward pricing pressure on, uh, on the supply chain, it creates resiliency in that supply chain, and, and then the, similarly, the defense market provides early stage R&D capital so that we can accelerate to market for both those customers, and, and then finally, uh, both defense and, uh, and commercial really help our investors as well. And so, so this, these three kind of stakeholders are, are, are all benefited because the dual use nature reduces our risk uh, across a number of, of areas and, uh, and allows us to accelerate again that delivery to, to, our, to our markets. 
That's very interesting. And could you talk about, you know, you're building sea gliders in Rhode Island, you know, rich maritime history. But what you're doing, you talked about the redundancy and the resiliency of if you have this consumer market, you're going to have more of a labor force that's experts in sea glider. Could you kind of double click on that? Like, you know, that build out of that structure where, you know, it's going to support the defense market, too, because you're going to have experts across the country in sea glider technology and building it out. Yeah, I mean, I would say one of the challenges of any uh, startup that's building, a, you know, hard tech, physical technology, particularly at the scale of, of a sea glider, is, is a labor force. And again, both defense and uh, commercial markets give us an opportunity to make sure that we've got a, a robust sales capability to be able to support that labor force, be able to support the training, and I think really, again, reduce manufacturing risk. And on the low signature missions, could you talk about that kind of how the sea glider is, is pretty low signature in a way in defense? Yeah, absolutely. So just by nature of, of how the sea glider operates, low over the water at high speed, uh, it, it's flying below radar in the sea clutter, but it's not disturbing the water column. So there's no sonar uh, picture below, nor is it uh, vulnerable to undersea uh, attack. Um, it's full carbon fiber, so the radar reflection is significantly less than a traditional um, steel ship or, or aircraft. And, and finally, uh, the IR and heat signature that's uh, output is significantly less than a traditionally uh, fueled jet engine. Um, you know, it's electric motors that produce nearly zero uh, IR signature and very low acoustic signature. And from the hybrid version, we're displaying bursting the exhaust to uh, reduce the uh, the heat and IR signature overall. And could you touch on the ease of operations, right? You know, you can upskill people quickly to be able to fly the region craft, you know, um, in a way, you know, that's a lot different from a, a plane. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, end of day, like these vessels are going to be operated by professional mariners, but the time required to get that professional mariner licensure and then get trained up in sea gliders is much lower than the aviation domain. Uh, but we're not trading uh, time to train for safety, right? So what we're providing for our customers is this, uh, uh, you know, unparalleled training program that's provided through the factory that's coupled with the onboard uh, sensor suite and systems for the vessel itself uh, to allow these mariners to operate sea gliders uh, safely. Um, so you, you combine, uh, you know, the, the aftermarket support with the, the training and all of the regulatory interface, and you have a, a platform that's going to be ready for service day one when uh, deliveries take place. And last question, could you talk about the platform you're sitting in, kind of the mock-up of it, and, you know, when is it going to be ready? Yeah, okay, well, the vessel itself is already in test today. That's the prototype, the full-scale prototype. Um, so what the, the, the mock-up that I'm sitting in is uh, an, an early rendition of what that interior is going to look like. So if you were to take all that sensor data out of the back of our prototype, this is kind of what it would look like in the, uh, in the uh, passenger configuration. So six foot high, five feet wide, 27 feet long. This is going to be an unparalleled client uh, you know, customer experience, whether it's the military, uh, you know, fulfilling their logistics mission or uh, my customers moving passengers to their doctor's appointments. This is going to be a one of a kind way of moving people around uh, around the world. Yep, it looks like a luxury airliner inside. Very nice. Yeah, and when you have space, you have all kinds of different things you can do with it, right? So we can provide our customers these nice plush seats. We can provide them a 19-inch aisle. Uh, we can provide them 34 inches of seat pitch. So uh, you take an amazing platform like this, and there's really good things you can do with it to make the user experience more comfortable. And one last question on the defense side. You know, you have relationships with the U.S. Coast Guard, with SOCOM, you know, the contract with the Marines. What has the feedback been from the DOD, DHS, Coast Guard? Yeah, uh, I mean, bottom line, the feedback is uh, get this asset in the hands of, of the warfighter as quickly as we can. Um, you know, there's this unmet need in the maritime space. As, as the DOD has shifted from land-based conflict in the Middle East for the last, you know, two plus decades to how do we operate in the maritime environment and deter conflict uh, in, in an entirely new uh, environment. And, and so the, the, the feedback has been, get these into the hands of the warfighter uh, immediately. 
but also safely and effectively. And, and, and that's, again, where this dual-use uh, network between the commercial and the defense market, as we, as we test and validate the prototype and go to manufacturing, um, we're, we're ready to meet that demand. One last thing, could you talk about kind of the ease of launch and also the range between like an island chain per se? Yeah, uh, I mean, the Sea Glider uses existing dock uh, infrastructure. And if that in the austere environment in the defense, if the dock infrastructure doesn't exist, there are solutions uh, through some industry partners that can provide a, a deployable docking solution. So, so that's all. That's all taken care of. From a range standpoint, our hybrid electric uh, sea glider uh, can exceed 1,400 nautical miles. That's, that's longer than the distance from Guam to Okinawa in the first island chain. Immediately refuel and, uh, and, and do operations in and around Taiwan if needed. So, so from a range standpoint, we exceed any other asset, both from uh, longer range than an aircraft uh, or a helicopter, However, the speed that is, you know, eight, nine, ten times a surface vessel. Well, congrats on the launch of Regent Defense and congrats Thank on you. all the commercial success as well. Thank you so much for the time. All right. Great to be here. Thank, Thank you. you. I appreciate it.